the ghost that lives in your phone and knows you better than you know yourself. Hello, deep explorers. Welcome back. Today, we're doing something special. We're going to descend together through five levels of understanding, each one deeper and more revealing than the last. And the theme of our journey is that feeling we've all had, that strange sensation that there's something inside our phone, a kind of ghost, an invisible intelligence that seems to know us, that watches us, and sometimes even seems to guess our thoughts. But we're not just here to share curious anecdotes, we're here to understand. Because comprehending this digital ghost isn't just about understanding technology, it's about understanding ourselves in the modern world. I promise you this, by the end of this journey, this descent through five levels, you'll never look at your phone screen the same way again. Let's start at level one, the surface of the known. Here we encounter the most famous phenomenon of all, those mind-reading ads. You just talked about buying new sneakers, and suddenly, boom, sneaker ads are everywhere. Uh, the simplest explanation, the one we all tend to share, is that it's not magic, and they're not listening through your microphone, or at least not always. It's simply that our clicks, our searches, and the pages we visit leave a trail, like breadcrumbs in the digital forest. Another popular aspect living on the surface is the famous For You page, or video recommendations that infinite scroll of content that seems perfectly designed to keep us glued to the screen. And this directly affects our daily behavior. The ghost doesn't just know what you like, it decides what you'll watch next, what song you'll listen to, what news you'll read. It subtly shapes our entire day. The most universal example is vacation planning. You search for information about a beach trip, and for the next two weeks, the internet turns into a giant catalog of flights, hotels, and sunscreen. Sound familiar? And a third basic fact of the surface layer, location tracking. Your phone knows where you live, where you work, which coffee shop you frequent. It knows your routine better than anyone. Originally, all of this started with good intentions. Historically, it was designed to be useful, to help you find the fastest route home or to recommend a good restaurant near you. Imagine it's a story that began with a small deal. We agreed to give up a little bit of information in exchange for a free map or a fun app. But that small deal, repeated billions of times, unknowingly became the largest surveillance system in human history. Everything we've just mentioned, the ads, the recommendations, the location, is just the tip of the iceberg. It's what the ghost allows us to see on the surface of the water. But if this is what we see on the surface, what secret mechanisms are driving it from beneath? Welcome to level two, the hidden mechanisms. And here's the first big revelation. It's not just about loose data points. Companies use them to build a ghost profile of you a digital avatar, a model of your personality. And this is crucial to understand. They don't just know you searched for sneakers. They know your approximate age, your potential income, your political interests, if you're in a relationship, if you're introverted or extroverted. They're constructing a version of you. Now this knowledge has a dual application, a double-edged sword. Let's start with the opportunity. Knowing this, you can train your ghost. You can consciously feed it with the person you want to become. For example, if you want to learn about astronomy, start intentionally searching for, reading, and watching videos on the topic. In a short time, your phone will transform into an incredible content curating machine, bringing you documentaries, articles, and courses you otherwise wouldn't have found. But here's the risk, the other side of the coin. This mechanism can also create very dangerous negative spirals. The ghost doesn't distinguish between what's good or bad for you. If one day you're feeling a bit down and start consuming negative or pessimistic content, the algorithm will detect it and feed you more of the same, thinking that's what you want. It can trap you in a bubble of negativity, reinforcing your worst impulses. This entire system is governed by an invisible rule that controls everything. It's not a rule of ethics or quality. It's the relentless rule of interaction. Let me explain this rule. The system doesn't care if a news story is true or false, if a video is educational or trash. It only cares about one thing, your reaction. A like, a comment, a share, or even the simple act of pausing to look at a photo for two seconds is a victory for the system. That's why the most controversial, outrageous, or extreme content goes viral so often. It's not because it's the best, but because it's designed to provoke an immediate emotional reaction. It hooks your attention, and to the algorithm, that's the only thing that counts. And the internal structure of this is even more complex. When you leave your data in an app, it doesn't always stay there. There's an entire hidden industry of data brokers, companies that buy and sell ghost profiles wholesale. This mechanism connects directly with a very powerful cognitive bias, a kind of glitch in our mental operating system, confirmation bias. This bias is, in essence, a factory default in our brain. Our brains love, they're fascinated by hearing information that confirms what they already believe. It's easier, it consumes less energy, and it makes us feel smart. The algorithm knows this and exploits it perfectly. 
but we can counteract it. A very powerful mental strategy is to actively seek out disagreement. Dedicate five minutes a day to reading or watching something from a source you know holds an opinion completely opposite to yours. It's uncomfortable, but it's like a gym for your critical thinking. So from now on, when you see a headline that makes you think, aha, I knew it, pause, activate your mental alert. Be doubly skeptical. Ask yourself, is this really true or is it just music to my ears? Let's consider how a simple custom shaped this. The like button, for instance. Its creators have stated their original intention was just a quick way to say, I've seen this or interesting. A simple feedback tool? The takeaway for today is that we, as a society, took that tool and turned it into a thermometer for our self-esteem and social validation. The ghost didn't force us. It simply provided the tool, and our own human psychology did the rest. And everything we've seen at this level leads us to a key deduction, the most important one for real life. Remember this general rule. If a service on the internet is free, you are not the customer. You are the product. The product being sold to advertisers is your attention and your ghost profile. So the next time you use a free social network, remember, you are paying, but the currency is your own information. Understanding this empowers you. You stop being a mere passive user and become a conscious participant in the system. And that, my friend, changes everything. But if you thought we already had a clear picture, get ready, because this is where the story truly descends into chaos. Welcome to level three, the chaos of reality. This is where the debates and complexities truly emerge. And the first major controversy is, where does personalization end and manipulation begin? On one hand, tech companies say, we're just showing you things you'll like, we're making your life easier. On the other hand, critics respond, you're not reflecting our desires, you're creating them. You're shaping our opinions without us even realizing it. What's at stake in this debate is fundamental. On one hand, convenience and a tailored experience. On the other, our autonomy our ability to make free decisions without being subtly nudged in one direction. And this forces us to challenge a deeply ingrained popular belief, the idea that it doesn't affect me, I'm too smart for ads to manipulate. It's like the myth of incognito mode in browsers. Many believe that by using it, they become invisible online. The reality is, it only prevents your history from being saved on your device, but the pages you visit and your internet providers still know perfectly well who you are and where you've been. And we love to believe in these myths because they give us back a sense of control and illusion of privacy. It's a psychological blanket that makes us feel safe in a digital world that deep down, we intuitively know we don't control at all. This leads us to a fascinating paradox that researchers call the privacy paradox. In surveys, we all say we value our privacy immensely, but in practice, we give it away every day for the slightest convenience, a discount, a fun personality test, or avoiding having to create a new password this becomes a philosophical dilemma with no easy answer. How much personal freedom are we willing to sacrifice in exchange for security and comfort? There's no single right answer for everyone. Now, let's adopt a truly critical point of view for a moment. Let's consider the ethical objection. We accept them using our digital ghost to sell us pizza, but what if they use it to influence an election or to create a social credit system that decides whether you can buy a train ticket or not? Because this isn't science fiction, it's already happening in some parts of the world. And here rises another key controversy, that of filter bubbles or echo chambers. If we analyze this over time, the change is stark. Decades ago, most people got their information from a handful of major media outlets. Today, each person's reality is micro-filtered by an algorithm. Your news feed is unique to you and completely different from your neighbors. This connects with something very profound about the human condition, our tribal need to belong to a group, to feel part of something larger. And here's the fundamental problem this creates for us as a species. The ghost in the phone exploits that need, separating us into digital tribes that have less and less common language and more distrust towards one another. It's accelerating social polarization on an unprecedented scale. As you can see, the reality isn't simple. There are no clear good guys or bad guys. It's a chaotic, complex system full of contradictions and with consequences that affect the very core of our society. You've survived the chaos. Now it's time to dive into the details that separate the curious from the truly knowledgeable. We're entering level four, expert knowledge. And the first niche concept you need to know is the digital double. Some researchers call it that. Think of it as a voodoo doll made of data, a version of you that exists solely on servers and what they do to it affects you in the real world. The technical detail that makes this possible is called psychographic microsegmentation. Let me explain with an analogy. Normal advertising is like a salesperson shouting their offer in the middle of a town square. 
psychographic micro-segmentation is like a mentalist who sits with you, knows your fears, your hopes, your personality type, and whispers the perfect sales pitch to you at your moment of greatest vulnerability. Now imagine that mentalist can do this for millions of people at once. And here we need to talk about a key figure often overlooked in popular conversation, a researcher named Michal Kosinski. His story is that of a secret tragic hero. In a famous study at Cambridge University, he demonstrated that with just a few hundred Facebook likes, your personality could be predicted with greater accuracy than by your own friends or family. He discovered the power of this ghost and immediately warned the world of its dangers. This leads us to an alternative, almost rebellious theory. The idea that perhaps we don't have preferences as stable as we believe. And that the algorithm doesn't discover them, but rather creates them. It's a perspective that flips everything on its head. Perhaps the digital ghost isn't a reflection of who we are. Perhaps we, little by little, are becoming a reflection of the ghost. We start to act like the simplified, predictable version the algorithm has created of us. And now, a detail from scientific research that is entirely counterintuitive. Studies from centers like Microsoft Research have revealed that often the most predictive data about you isn't even your own data. It's the data of your friends and contacts, this clashes with our intuition because we like to think we're sovereign individuals. But the reality is we are social beings. They can know what you're going to do or buy based solely on the behavior of the people you surround yourself with, even if you've protected your own information to the maximum. Now connect all the pieces. The ghost in your phone isn't made just of your searches. It's made of your brain's confirmation bias, the invisible rule of interaction, your friend's data, and the history of every single place you've ever been. And here comes the aha moment. It's not a ghost. It's an ecosystem. It's a new form of digital life that has grown intertwined with ours, feeding on our attention and our very humanity. Reaching this level of detail gives us a much more authentic and profound insight. It allows us to move beyond my phone is spying on me to truly understand the hidden structures that govern much of our modern life. From here, we enter uncharted territory. Do you dare to look towards the final frontier? You're at level five, the final frontier? Speculation and wonder. And the first futuristic idea is inevitable. What happens to your digital ghost when you die? The concept of a digital legacy. If we project this 100 years into the future, could we use these incredibly detailed ghost profiles to create interactive AI simulations of deceased individuals? Imagine being able to talk to a digital version of your great grandmother. And this is where science pushes against its own limits. Science can build the model. It can replicate speech patterns and memories, but can it replicate subjective experience? Can it ultimately replicate consciousness? At this point, science pauses and philosophy must take over. What does it mean to be you? Are you the sum of your memories? Your behavioral patterns? If an artificial intelligence can perfectly replicate all of that, at what point does it become a person? The philosophical implication is dizzying. If your identity, your essence can be copied, stored, and reproduced, what does that mean for the idea of a unique soul? Or an unrepeatable self? Are we, in the end, just incredibly complex patterns of information? And this idea connects directly with the future of humanity. It's not just some science fiction game. Imagine using the aggregated data from all digital ghosts, anonymously and ethically, to create a map of collective consciousness. We could anticipate economic crises, outbreaks of mental illness, or pandemics. Mastering this knowledge could be key to solving the greatest problems of our time. And here's the final idea I want to leave you with, the most provocative assertion of this entire journey. Perhaps the next step in human evolution won't be biological. Perhaps it will be the progressive fusion of our biological selves with our digital doubles, creating a new form of hybrid consciousness that we can't even begin to comprehend right now. And with that idea, our descent through the five levels has concluded. Take a deep breath. For a moment, contemplate the entire panorama we've covered together. Remember where we started? At the beginning of the video, on the surface, we talked about something as familiar and almost trivial as a sneaker ad following you around the internet. Now prepare for the ultimate contrast. Place that simple idea of an ad on one side of a scale, and on the other, place the idea of a potential hybrid human consciousness, digital and biological, that could redefine the very meaning of existence. We've journeyed from an everyday annoyance all the way to the very frontier of what it means to be human. That are that is the incredible transformation that occurs when we dare to ask why again and again. What idea from this entire journey, this descent through five levels, has impacted you the most or made you see your phone in a completely new way? I want to sincerely thank you from the bottom of my heart for investing your time and your valuable curiosity to join me on this exploration. I would truly love to read your own reflections and discoveries in the comment section below. 
If you've enjoyed this deep dive, subscribe so you don't miss the next ones, and share this video with that person you know also asks these kinds of questions. Stay curious, keep questioning, and never stop exploring. The next time your phone screen lights up, who's really looking back from the other side?